Um, so essentially, I'm going to be talking about verification of neural networks. Um, so, so the motivation of this talk uh, comes from AI, broadly speaking. So all of us are here because we believe in AI. We believe in the transformative power of AI. Um, and we have been seeing AI make incredible impacts on various sectors, including energy, healthcare, uh, finance. But as, as, as we go into all these various domains, it's important for us to be responsible and make sure that uh, our, our AI algorithms behave uh, well in the sense that they don't make bad decisions that have uh, significantly harmful consequences. Um, and we can already see lots of examples of this actually happening, uh, where we see examples with uh, self-driving cars, uh, with unfairness uh, in, in bank lending systems, uh, and with uh, systems in your home that record conversations and, and, and email them to others without your per permission. Um, and so this means that we actually need much stronger safety checks on our AI systems uh, to make sure that they are going to behave well under all possible situations. Um, and one canonical example of uh, uh, a mechanism through which AI systems fail is this uh, idea of having adversarial examples, right? So uh, deep learning has made significant uh, advances in, in ob object recognition and, and classification, uh, but these classifiers have been shown to be vulnerable uh, to specifically chosen uh, noise perturbations that cause the classifier to think that the label is, is a different label with very high confidence, right? Um, and if you think about uh, how do we formalize uh, the property of not having a phenomenon of this kind, we, we can write down a specification that says that if I have my input image to the classifier and I add a norm-bounded perturbation, um, I want to make sure that the output of the classifier remains the same for all perturbations within some set that I uh, allow for, right? Um, and uh, you can try to verify this property by trying to generate counterexamples, right? So you can try to generate an attack that causes the network to think that the label is something different. Uh, and uh, people have shown that because neural networks are differentiable, you can actually search for these counterexamples using gradient-based methods. Uh, for this particular network that we train, which is actually a rather robust network, uh, these gradient-based attacks actually fail to find a counterexample. So you might be tempted to conclude that this network was actually robust. Um, but if you actually are a little bit more careful about searching for a counterexample and you do a more exhaustive search, you can actually find um, a slightly different perturbation uh, that's actually a, a lot less noisier than, than this one uh, that actually causes the network to switch the label from nine to five, right? So this basically says that Unless you are very careful and systematic about searching for vulnerabilities of your neural network, you can actually end up with false conclusions of robustness or safety, right? So this underscores the need for verification, which is a systematic proof that your neural network is not vulnerable to these kinds of problems. And uh, you can see uh, we visualize the loss surface here. This is the loss surface for the adversary that's actually trying to maximize this difference and uh, uh, maximize the confidence in the wrong logic. Uh, so you can see here that um, there's this loss surface, and this is the, um, this is the perturbation uh, set. Um, and the projected gradient-based attack basically fails to see that there is this cliff here, and it basically gets stuck at this local minimum. But if you actually do an exhaustive search, you can actually find this true worst case example that flips the label from a nine to a five, right? So it is possible for these neural networks to have these complicated optimization landscapes that make it difficult for standard attack algorithms to, to find counterexamples, but if you actually do a systematic search, you would end up finding them. Um, and so essentially this, again, underscores the need for verification. Uh, having provable guarantees that no matter what attack algorithm you used, your network would not be vulnerable uh, to attack. Right, um, and and this actually plays up not just in these toy examples, but in 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 reality as well. There was this competition organized at NIPS last year, where uh, people were looking at new kinds of defenses as well as attacks on uh, image classifiers, um, and a number of interesting proposals came up. And it seemed during the competition that these proposals actually significantly enhanced the performance of uh, neural network classifiers under adversarial attacks. Uh, so these are the accuracies of these neural networks under adversarial attacks as per the standard evaluation used in the competition. However, if you actually did a better job of, of creating an adversary, you can actually push these accuracies down way below. So some of them you can actually push all the way down to zero, including one that actually won the, the second place in the competition at NIPS. 
right? Uh, so there was actually a couple of papers at ICML this year that documented this phenomenon. Okay, so, uh, so, so this all motivates the need for verification, but of course, if, if it were easy, everyone would have done it already. So verification is difficult in general. Uh, the most naive approach is to essentially discretize the space of inputs to your network and do like a brute force search over all the possibilities. Uh, unfortunately, this grows exponentially with the size of the input to the network. Um, and if you do a back of the envelope cal calculation, you can uh, calculate that even for a small data set like MNIST, uh, verifying that your network is robust to a 10% perturbation would take like order 10 to the thousand CPU years. Uh, and, and recently people have shown that it's NP hard to find the optimal attack even to approximate the optimal attack to within a constant factor, right? Um, so, if, so this means that we have to give up on complete verification algorithms uh, and, and, and somehow trade off scalability and completeness of the verification procedure. Um, and motivated by this observation, there have been a number of papers that have come up uh, in the literature in, in recent years, both in the formal methods community and uh, the machine learning community. Um, so, uh, so these algorithms can broadly be classified into two categories. Um, you have sound and complete verification algorithms that essentially, in the worst case, do brute force search, uh, but they're trying to be intelligent about it and try to prune the search space cleverly. So there are approaches that use uh, SAT and SMT solvers, uh, and there are approaches that use mixed integer programming uh, to do this brute force search. Um, so there's a lot of progress uh, on these kinds of approaches, but uh, still somewhat limited scalability, especially when we think about practically sized neural networks that are used uh, today. Um, so the alternative is to look for incomplete verification algorithms. So ones that uh, don't necessarily do a brute force search, but re rely on abstractions or relaxations of, of the nonlinearities in your neural network. Um, and there are approaches that use convex relaxations um, and approaches that use other kinds of abstractions like bounds or, or zonotopes and stuff. Um, and, and these approaches are significantly more scalable, uh, but um, they have been somewhat limited in terms of their general applicability uh, and uh, how complete they are, right? Um, so if we think about comparing all of these approaches, we can compare them on these four axes. Completeness means I have an algorithm that either finds a proof of correctness or finds a counterexample, uh, and it will never be indeterminate, right? Uh, complexity is just computational complexity. Backprop back friendly basically refers to this loose property that you can take your verification algorithm and use it as feedback to your training algorithm in the neural network so that you can train models that will end up being verifiable, right? Um, and, uh, and, and the last column is just talking about whether the approach can handle uh, activations that are not piecewise linear, so activations like sigmoids or, or tan Hs, uh, which come up often in applications. Um, so uh, a lot of the approaches from the formal methods community are, are complete, but they have questionable complexity because they will do a brute force search in the worst case, and because they are usually rely on mechanisms that are not differentiable, they are not backprop friendly, uh, and they typically make heavy use of piecewise linear structure uh, in the neural network. Uh, there's other approaches that have better complexity uh, and are backprop friendly, but don't apply to uh, general activation functions. And then there was this recent paper that I cleared last year uh, that handles uh, you know, sigmoids and tanages, but only for single hidden layers. So uh, our approach basically improves upon the complexity of these algorithms uh, to uh, an algorithm that has complexity that's linear in the size of the network. Uh, it is backprop friendly, it is a completely differentiable approach, uh, and it can generalize to any kind of activation function. Okay, so um, this is just a very high level geometric overview of how this verification process happens. So you can think about uh, some neural network that takes an input, crunches it through a number of layers, and then produces as output a label. Um, and uh, think about this as being the nominal input and this pink region as being the space of perturbations of the nominal input. Uh, it's going through a series of transformations. When it goes through linear operations, it's just going to go uh, through some kind of rescaling. Uh, and when it goes through nonlinearities, it's going to go through some kind of distortion. So at the end, you can get some very kind, very distorted shape that, that is the mapping of your original region. Um, and essentially, your task is to verify that this complicated region does not intersect the boundary of your decision service. Um, and if you're able to prove that this region does not intersect the decision boundary, then basically you can prove that uh, your label will remain the same, right? 
so one way to try and prove that this region does not intersect the boundary is to bound these regions with bounding boxes just by doing some kind of interval arithmetic based propagation of bounds. Uh, and in this example, at least, you can see that these bounds are, are getting loose as the network gets deeper, and it's not sufficient to prove that your uh, region does not intersect the decision boundary. So in our approach, what we end up doing is to tighten these uh, naive bounds uh, by adding cutting planes uh, by using ideas from duality and convex optimization. Um, and so essentially, you refine this uh, big uh, gray region uh, bounding box with these cutting planes, and you end up with this green approximation over approximation of your uh, pink region. Uh, and this is essentially sufficient to prove that you don't cross the decision boundary. Right. OK. Uh, so thinking about how we would formalize uh, this mathematically, um, so I'm going to think about neural net, uh, network verification as an optimization problem. My neural network takes some input and produces an output logits which represent my confidence for the various classes. Um, and my, my verification problem is stated as for all inputs within a certain set, I want that a, a certain linear constraint should hold between the logits that the network produces. Right? So think about this example where I was trying to do an adversarial perturbation of the input to change the label from 9 to a 5. I want to ensure that the score assigned to 5 minus the score assigned to 9 is smaller than 0. Right? So this is a, a concrete example of, of how this might materialize. OK, uh, so, so this, this is all fine in terms of the problem setup. How do I solve this? Um, you can think about posing this as an optimization problem that's searching for a counterexample. So I'm trying to find a choice of the inputs to the network that will violate this property. So I can think about setting up an optimization problem that just maximizes the linear uh, function I'm trying to, to bound, uh, subject to these constraints that say that the, the activations at layer k plus 1 should be some transformation applied to the activations at layer k. So this transformation could be a convolution, it could be applying a ReLU or a Tange or a Sigmoid, any, any of the standard operations you would do in your neural network. And then you have your constraints on the input, right? So if I solve this optimization problem exactly and I find that the optimal value is smaller than zero, then I know that there was no input that violated the property I'm trying to satisfy. Uh, unfortunately, because of these nonlinear constraints, this optimization problem is difficult in general. And so what we're going to do is a very natural idea. We're going to do a Lagrangian relaxation of this constraint. So essentially, we're going to inc introduce this Lagrange multiplier that, uh, that multiplies this constraint. But in addition, I'm also going to propagate some bounds on each of the intermediate activations. So I only have constraints on the input, but I know what transformations they're going to go through. And so I can propagate bounds on all of the intermediate activations. Uh, and essentially, I can set up this relaxed optimization problem. Um, and it turns out that this relaxed optimization problem is very easy to solve. Uh, it actually becomes completely separable in terms of the activations at the various layers of the network. And I can solve the optimization independently. Uh, and uh, you can show that for most common choices of the activation functions, you can solve this analytically. Right. OK, so if I think about, uh, so, so I have now solved this optimization problem. I have something that is just a function of the Lagrange multiplier's lambda that I picked. And essentially, what you can show by weak duality is that for any choice of these dual variables lambda, um, I will have an upper bound on the optimization problem that I was originally trying to solve. So if I, at any point, if I was able to demonstrate to you a value of lambda such that this function f of lambda was smaller than 0, then I have a certificate that there was no input to the neural network that would verif uh, violate the property I was trying to satisfy. Right? Um, and then I can try to find the best possible bound by optimizing this function with respect to lambda. Uh, and this ends up being an unconstrained convex optimization problem. Uh, and if this minimum is smaller than 0, or even without actually optimizing all the way, if at any point during the optimization process I find a lambda for which this is smaller than 0, then essentially I have a proof that my network is safe. Right? Um, so this is all well and good, but uh, for those of you who understand optimization well, you know that non-convex optimization problems typically have duality gaps. And so even if this minimum value was not smaller than zero, it is possible that the network was actually safe. Right? So then the question is, can we do better? Can we say that this value is actually going to guarantee to be 
uh, the exact optimum under special assumptions? Um, and uh, that's the question that we asked. Uh, can verification actually be done tractably under special assumptions? Um, in general, it's difficult, and we had to make very strong assumptions, but I think this could be the basis for further results uh, of this type. So what we showed is that if your input set is just a two-norm constraint uh, saying that your input is within some epsilon in the two-norm of your or some nominal point, and you have a network with just a single hidden layer, then uh, you can prove two facts. The first is that if your epsilon is small enough compared to a constant that depends on the parameters of the neural network, you can solve this verification problem exactly using a projected gradient-like algorithm. So that situation that I showed earlier with those local minima cannot happen. Um, and otherwise, you can show that you can achieve an additive ap approximation of the, of the optimization problem by solving a translation problem. So, so these results are not really very practical, but I think they're interesting in the sense that they show that under certain conditions, you can actually solve verification problems exactly. Uh, and I think uh, there's lots of scope for further work uh, in this space. So um, we have a lot of uh, results on just looking at verification of uh, the absence of adversarial examples. But uh, I think I, I wanted to talk about some more prop interesting properties. So the first one is this idea of uh, classifier stability, where we looked at essentially uh, predicting whether a GitHub repository will reach a certain number of commits at the end of three months, right? And the features that you're using to make this prediction is the number of commits and the number of committers. But these features are constantly evolving over time as the repository evolves. And so you can think about your classifier as making updated predictions on the basis of this updated information. But it's possible that your classifier exhibits this kind of strange behavior where it says that, yes, the, the repository will reach a certain number of commits for some time, and then it says no, and then it says yes again and, and no. And so if the classifier keeps switching between saying yes and no, uh, that's perhaps uh, an undesirable property, especially for production scale ML systems. And so you want to understand how often does the prediction switch as the features evolve. And you can actually solve this with our verification approach. Uh, and the green curves are basically uh, averaged over several different repositories uh, with confidence intervals. The uh, verification based bound on the number of times uh, the fraction of times in which your classifier would switch predictions. Uh, and the red curve is the best attack. So in, in this case, at least, essentially, the verification gives you a very tight result that either you're able to verify uh, exactly the number of times the classifier will switch, or you're able to produce a counterexample that exactly matches that number. Um, in the interest of time, I will actually skip this next example uh, and just uh, take a few minutes to highlight some ongoing work where we're thinking about essentially taking this verification approach and feeding it back into the learning algorithm. So we want to train networks such that at the end of training, they are verifiable with respect to whatever properties you're interested in. Uh, and in order to make this uh, verified learning problem tractable, what we found is that you can actually train another neural network that takes as input your image and produces output these dual variables, which actually give you a bound on the maximum violation of the verification problem being satisfied. And you can actually simultaneously train your predictor and these verified networks together. Uh, and if you're interested, we have a preprint on archive uh, on this topic. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with, with some future directions. Um, so of course, I talked about these very special conditions under which, under which we can do verification tractably. Um, can these results be extended further? Um, in our experiments on, on, on the next paper uh, that I highlighted, um, we found that if you integrate verification into the learning algorithm, you actually end up finding networks for which this duality gap I was talking about is very small. Um, and that's an interesting phenomenon, and it would be interesting to see if we can explain this theoretically. So in some sense, by training for verifiability, you end up finding networks that are easy to verify, right? Um, and then we can think about uh, essentially these uh, verification approaches that use brute force enumeration, and you can think about maybe using reinforcement learning or uh, Monte Carlo tree search style algorithms to essentially learn to guide the verification process as it goes through this brute force search. Um, and another interesting question is, we're likely to have multiple properties that we want our networks to satisfy in many practical applications. Most likely, you're not going to be able to satisfy all these properties perfectly. So it's an interesting question about how you make trade-offs between satisfying various properties versus getting good predictive performance. So with that, uh, I will 
end with this kind of vision for uh, what I call specification-driven ML, where we take our machine learning models that are trained with training data, but augment them with these additional properties that are desirable features in the context of the application that we're working on. Uh, we take learning algorithms um, and we combine them with verification algorithms to at the end produce what I call a, a verified implementation where you have a predictor that does the that solves the prediction problem you're interested in, but also some kind of checker that that makes sure that your predictor is actually consistent with all these properties that you desire to be true in the context of that application. Uh, and with this, I'll acknowledge my collaborators and uh, take any questions. Thanks. <laughs>